Okay, good morning, everybody. So today we are going to, to talk about design principles and we will dedicate this hour to uh, design <coughs> principles as things you can use to continue and to design your, to keep in mind to design your user application, your user interface and then your prototype, your application, etc. Uh, before doing that, uh, let me say one thing about the solutions uh, that you are going to, to create or you created for assignment one. Um, so the text asks you for defining three, four deep user needs. So the one that are more significant or that happens more frequently, etc. And for each of them, brainstorm five solutions each five different solutions each, of course. Uh, and then to vote in a way or to select one top solution from one need. So if in the end you uh, have um, a single solution as the top solution that fit only one need is, is the right thing, is not a problem, is actually expected to do that. So you don't need to find solution that match multiple needs by default. It may happen and it's fine if it happens, but otherwise it's totally fine if one solution fits one deep need. And if the solution is formalized properly and the need is actually a deep need, that should give you enough work for the semester, for do all the prototyping that you need for the semester, not for do version 12 of an application to sell tomorrow, but to do the 0 0.1 alpha version that is needed in the semester okay and in this course so one solution that fits one need and i need to point you out again to the text of assignment one where there are examples of solutions and example of needs that fit that solutions uh, so that you can see with practical example some levels of description of a solution that is not like a to the list for user to interact with and do things but is something slightly different so if the the example is on the transportation domain with the courier with a driver that is delivering items so it's probably not a good fit for all of you but for instance for those who reason around my slot that could be something not too far from um, what they are doing because it's still around exploring even it's for drivers bringing and moving items with that uh, in any case even if the solution is not totally right or the needs are not totally written in a proper way you still have the feedback tomorrow and then you can of course edit it amend it refine it before proceeding with assignment two that will start next week so you will have one week to fix any items any small details hopefully that you uh, have to before continuing with the next step of the process again the feedback is there to help you get the right direction is not that's why we don't grade you at the deliver of assignment one but we give you feedback to understand if you did something correctly or not and how well and fix it before continuing and another thing that yesterday someone asked to me is what happens to the slides you provide tomorrow so those slides are just for the feedback we are not looking at them anymore after tomorrow so you are free to edit it after tomorrow to just leave it in that way for the exam you will need to provide a report a document not slides so that will be the final source of information you will be evaluated for and about not the slides that you provide so the slides are temporary artifacts to enable a discussion tomorrow without reading 20 pages of documents but just skimming through slides with the key elements we ask you hmm? so this is just to clarify and this the same will happen for assignment two the slides will be just for the feedback and then not, no one will look at 
anymore and you can decide again to continue working on the slides to give a reference to write something else somewhere else notes or other things that's totally up to you any question on this okay so design principles before starting about design principle a short hall of fame or shame so look at this picture um do you think is more all of fame or of shame and why shame. who say shame okay who say fame why fame yes the, the clarity uh there is not much text and there is color smiley faces or not and it's clarity and so this is of course a pro of this of this picture but this is all a shame why it's all a shame D despite the pro that still stay there are many options to choose from and mm. differences. no there's not a, a an issue there is a scale between zero and ten so it's it's fine but there is one thing that is really wrong here no, that's the same thing that he said. Sorry. Yes, no, it's not about the 10 levels. You, you can do it with five, but still have the same issue. There is one fundamental issue. The fact that the scale is subdividing two, two li lines, but make me feel like it's two things that I have to break uh, separately. Yeah, um, sh shorter scale, single line could be improvement, but there is one thing that is worse than all of this. the fact that smiley faces are only for 9 10. so we talk about leading questions this is a leading answer so the the creator of this small survey what think that is a good answer among this number which number are good from the according to the creator perspective 9 and 10 and which are bad answer zero to six so zero to six is terrible uh let's say uh, so zero to three is really terrible four to six is quite terrible but six out of ten out of eleven is actually more than sufficient right uh seven or eight that is actually a pretty high score out of a scale from zero to eleven is actually a pretty good score but the phase is still mm, not like not mm, not there and the only right answer for the creator are 9 and 10 so if you look at it and you want to pick the smiley face you will pick either 9 and 10 but actually if you get if you get 8 is still a very valuable results out of 11 in this case so 8 out of 11 is a very good score so why having a neutral not so happy face is actually uh, so the emoji the, the emoticon uh, is actually a nice addiction but this is leading in saying that the right answer are 9 and 10 and everything else is not quite good so try to answer 9 and 10 so this is of course leading and this should be avoided uh, this is in a way a deceptive pattern trying to say that 9 and 10 just the extreme is very very good and everything else is actually not so good so this should be put in the all of shame for this reason then as you said there is clarity there is colors there is consistency there are a lot of things that work well but just for this pattern the sip the sip the pattern that should be uh, put in the all of shame okay so um we are talking about design today and design principles so it's sort of related but also not uh, so where we are now we are uh, that we we did uh, or we talk about observations and in finding that here and derive some analysis and synthesis some requirements in a way and we want to uh, now build on let's say theories processes documents to build a successful user interface and then we will move 
on prototyping and user interface software tools and also on expert review and usability testing. But principles, design principles, are something that can be used building on theories to build a successful user interface and also, since this other spot is yellow, but also to evaluate them. So principles could be things that you keep in mind while designing and things that you use for evaluating. So they could have a double meaning. So in this moment, we are focusing on generating, creating design solution, not evaluating. That will be um, something that we will do. You see here there is heuristic. We, you know that we will do an heuristic evaluation. We will talk about heuristic evaluation. So those heuristics are principle used to evaluate user interface. And there also, for instance, usability testing. That is another thing we are going to, to cover at the end of the course that sort of uses some of these um, criteria for evaluating. But now we are in the phase in which we want to generate the design solution. We want to start prototyping, uh, let's say in our case, next week. And so what we need to look at, uh, what we can look at are principle theories and guidelines. And today we will just briefly talk about theories. We already met one theory in the second class of the course, so we are not spending much time on theories. We will talk about principle and guidelines and design patterns. Instead, we will postpone them towards uh, in a few weeks around the course because principles are the appropriate level in this moment to keep in mind for um, designing solution, design application. So, what's the difference between the three of them? Um, so, theories are the more abstract definitions. They are theoretical, as the name say, be their theory. And they are totally general. They can be applied to whatever domain. Doesn't matter if it's a mobile application, a web application, a wearable application, virtual reality, uh, interaction with AI, doesn't matter. They are theory that explain or prescribe or describe how things work in the world and with technology. So they are abstract and theoretical. Uh, on the other edge, we have the practical, operational, specific things that are the guidelines. So guidelines are low level advice that implement in a way principles that, that implements as such theories and give concrete and practical operational description on what, what to do in a specific case. So for instance, there are guidelines for human AI interaction. And these are specific guidelines that only pertain to the domain of human AI interaction and cannot be used for virtual reality or mobile application in general, because they are only for that. There are guidelines for accessibility hmm, that explain how to make a web application accessible for people with disability, and then specific case in a practical way. And for instance, if you did the web application course, you should know that one of the things uh, that you should do is to add an alt tag to every image. And this alt stands for alternate text. And this is actually one guideline for the web accessibility guidelines that prescribe that you should have every image should have an alternative text as a description for people with low vision or um, who are blind at all. Hmm? So on one side, you have theories, general, and on the other side, you have guidelines, very specific, like alt attribute in images on the web. Hmm? That is not the same attribute that you can have on mobile, because mobile, you don't have the same system for describing things. And in the middle of this, there are principles. Principles, as written here, are mid-level strategies or rules to analyze and compare and build, we also said, design alternatives. Principle being the middle is something that is 
midway between something totally theoretical and something extremely practical, like the alt uh, attribute on, um, on images on the web, and something that is still quite general and also applied to specific case. But it's not, they are not something that work only for the web or work only for um, the, the mobile application or virtual reality. They are a little bit more generic, but less generic than theories. Okay, so we are focusing today on principles. Uh, I will just say a couple of words about theories because there are two things that are interesting and that I want to convey to you now because they are also useful for principle as a baseline for principle. And we will see again guidelines together with design patterns uh, a little bit later since they are very specific about a specific platform, a specific implementation. And so that will be more close to the high fidelity prototype that we will do. So I mentioned to you that we um, cover, we have seen one theory, second class. Do you remember or do you can guess which is this theory that we have seen in the second lesson? The second lesson was like a couple of weeks ago, not years ago. So we, the second lesson was introduction to human computer interaction, not introduction to the course. And we were in the, in the room of the lab, first hours there. Uh, really packed the room, a lot of people, so just this is the context. Uh, at a certain point, we talk about doors. Do you remember we talk about doors? When we talk about doors, what I was talking about? about the sequence, the diagram, and the diagram as a name, which is? Nor, uh, it starts with no. No, no. The name runs the or something like that. Yes. Sorry. The normal uh, model. Mm -hmm. So the normal model, this case called action model, if you remember, uh, the goal from the plan and then the goal for execution, the goal for evaluation, etc. All the things we, we said that, and I'm not going to, to repeat it, if you don't remember, look at the, at the video, uh, is actually a theory because it explains how things work, but it's, it's general. It applies to doors, it applies to buttons, it applies to user interface. It's a theory, it's generic, it's very high level. Hmm? And it, as a theory, it is uh, explanatory. So describe a sequence of events with causal relationship. And there are other types of theory like descriptive, prescriptive, predictive, etc. And the match with the human capacity. That again, we, um, the theory can also uh, cover human capacity in terms of the motor task, the skill we have in doing stuff, our perception in terms of inputs, and our cognitive capacity. And again, also some of these we cover in that same lecture. Um, because we started with some theory to build up and to give the context. So Norman diagram is one theory we covered. Just an example of a prescriptive theory is a consistency theory. And I, I keep it in the slides because we will met consistency so many times that it makes sense to just talk now. So this theory is still generic. It say that consistency of noun and verbs are good. That means everything uh, and is again general consists of noun and verbs where in a piece of paper on on the wall on a user interface on a mobile interface is a vocal interface is general and it's it's general because it's a theory so but a theory what what tell us the theory it's already one thing to keep in mind in designing the user interface that consistency of noun verbs colors, layout across pages, icons, fonts, button size, etc., are is good, is generally good. So we like consistency. It gives a sense of familiarity, reduce learning times, reduce errors. So that's why if you think of a web application or a mobile application, the layout of the application doesn't change across pages if it's well done. Um, that's why the color are consistent within the application. That's why the button size, if the OK button is 
20 pixel large, that will be 20 pixel large for the entire application because of consistency. Mm? So consistency in general, and then we will see exception, but consistency in general is good and something we want to keep in mind and use. Consistency is naming, here there is an example, delete insert charter, delete insert word, delete insert line. If you have this in a menu, repeating delete and insert instead of changing, delete and insert with other things like adding, inserting instead of insert, etc., it actually help reducing errors of a user of your application, of your system or your whatever, and reduce also learning time because our brain is wired to appreciate consistency and see patterns where there are things that may emerge and so if we provide patterns if we provide consistency that's easier for us to use it inconsistency might be used sparkly for for instance drawing attention and we will see an example so when we see some when in a consistent environment we see something inconsistent we immediately draw our attention there and so if that is a dangerous situation is a dangerous action that inconsistency there is actually good because we want to pick our attention on something that is not okay not normal hmm? um, and we will see an example so another theory very very briefly is again on the uh, human capability is the human processor model that is depicted with this nice picture here that is basically is a, a method used to calculate in milliseconds how long it takes to perform a task by a typical person hmm? so without going into much details but here they say for instance that the high movement is on average 230 milliseconds and then if something that is seen needs also to be perceived is another 100 and then if it's just a visual image to keep in mind for a while is another 200 instead if it is, there is sound or there is also sound you have to add another value hmm? so this is uh, a model with issues with things that are missing like uh, the actual time to do a movement um, to complete a movement on the real world that is used to predict the system performance. So if I have a task to do with a system, with an interface, etc., how much it would take for a person to realize, to do the task. And that also, the physical world, it's easy to calculate, but in, in the brain, it's not so easy. So this is a model that simplifies uh, this calculation. And, and it's, it's used in other use a bit techniques we are not going to to see but it's a model it's a theory again general it doesn't say anything particular about a specific situation a specific person a specific condition uh, but this is linked with memory that is one thing to keep in mind um, so we we roughly have two kind of memory the short-term memory the long-term memory the long-term memory is virtually unlimited so it's not something we should worry about it has lower access time, so accessing information in the long-term memory is longer and it's a little decay, so it means that once we remember something, once something is in the long-term memory, we will unlikely uh, forget it. The working memory that is the one to use more frequently is the short-term memory. It has a small capacity and the capacity is around 7 more or less seven chunks of information which means that if you get this like a number this is longer than seven chunks of information because here it's each chunk is actually a, a number so that's longer but if we see this with a space we can identify four chunks of information so if you try to look at that and try to remember for a few seconds, it's for you easier to remember the second one than the first one. Because your mind, your capacity as a human being, it's easier for them, for us to remember these four separate chunks of number with respect to the full number without any separation, without any pattern again in evidence. Uh, similar for numbers. It's easier for us to remember the 
FGI, HHJ, LMQ separate in these three chunks of information than not the longer string without a separation. So this is the small capacity of the working memory. We can say keep seven chunks of information. And of course, this information cannot be much, um, can be longer than, cannot be big enough. Uh, but in this case, it, that's why, for instance, explain why we can remember chunks, number easier, ch numbers in chunks, in separated, than not a long list of numbers without any pattern, without any uh, rules without any um, grouping. And the working memory has a rapid access also with respect to the long-term memory, but it decays. That's why we forget things after a while. Hmm? Um, but we, of course, move to the short-term memory before using the long-term memory, and for some information we want to keep in the long-term memory, we pass them from the short memory to the long-term memory. Again, what's tell, telling us for designing application? Telling us that if we have information that people want to keep in mind from one page to another, for instance, they should be not a lot, and they should be possibly divided in some chunks that are easier to keep in mind with respect of a long string of character or text or images or whatever. Um, and then the, the last theory, when then we move to the principles, is actually a mathematical law that is called the Fitts law uh, that say that the amount of time required for a person to move a pointer, this is a little bit more specific, it speaks about pointer, to a target area is a function of the distance of the target divided by the size of the target. This is a classical law, there is a demonstration with an animation that link, if you are curious, uh, that basically say that the longer the distance and the smaller the target size, let's say the button, the thing to click, the longer it takes to a person to do the, um, the actual click in the actual action. Uh, this is widely used in human interaction and, for instance, influence the convention of making a button on touch uh, display bigger than on mouse operated display. Why to you it's bug buttons in skin on mobiles are bigger generally or can be bigger than on a mouse uh, based computer or device. Our, finger is bigger than our, mouse. our pointer that is our finger is bigger than the point that the actual pointer that is like uh, one pixel two and we also navigate in a 3D space and not on a small surface, etc. So all, all of these, um, and it's also why why cancel and OK button in a modal are close, and not one on the left and one on the top right and one on the bottom left of the page. When you have a modal on a web application, you have OK a cancel button. They are always in which position? They are together or not? Together. They are together. And they are, they are together and the same position, the same area. Why? Because they are related. Because they are related, but also because of this. Because if you need to do an action, the action is there, is either cancel or okay. And so the movement between one button and the other should be short enough not to waste a lot of time to move from one button to another. So they are conceptually related, uh, but they are also um, um, to minimize the time required to move a pointer from the OK to the cancel, because they are close each other in the same position. So the movement if I don't know what to press, I can move the pointer and wait a little bit, and then if I change my mind, I can immediately, or almost immediately, move to another space mm, that is just closed there. Mm. So this is also a consequence, something that we, we it happens, it's not that we, uh, we, we ever thought about it, but we always seem close together related, also because the Fitts law. Um, that, by the way, Fitts was a psychology um, that was created this law. It's a mathematical law. There is a, a formula that you can apply 
1945 uh, using the human motor system. So it's not thought about mouses, etc., but was applied then because it's actually uh, a pertinent law. Okay, and this is just about uh, theory. So there are various kind of theories useful for different things and that inform our, some, some things that we experience every day because they are fun fundamental. Uh, design principles are, again, more practical than theories. They could be still widely applicable and, um, and we will cover a few of them. In particular, we will see the five primary interaction styles and the eight golden rules of interface, interface design. And then we will see the heuristics that can be considered other principle, but not today. Um, so interaction style. Uh, we have typically five interaction style that are the one reported in the slides. So there is direct manipulation. So when we want to interact with any interface, we have these five interaction style. Uh, direct manipulation. Direct manipulation is um, let's do an example of direct manipulation on a computer system, which is an example of a direct manipulation you do, let's say, on a desktop computer. Drag and drop. It's direct manipulation. You directly manipulate an element on the screen file, a folder, etc., and move it. So it's a manipulation like similar to the one they do in space, move things, but it's a direct manipulation. You manipulate an element of user interface in a direct way. Uh, and here there are some advantages. Advantage is, of course, easy to learn because it mimics uh, natural behavior as a disadvantage. It could be uh, hard to program. It's not it's, of course, easy to do any other things. Uh, if, to, if you need to move one element in a folder, it's easier to use a menu, to program a menu to do that, than not to implement a drag and drop from scratch. Hmm? So it's a little bit harder to, to program. Uh, menu selection. What is menu selection? You have a menu and you select objects in the menu. This is a totally different interaction style. It can co it coexist with direct manipulation. So in an operating system, you have uh, direct manipulation and menu selection. When you right-click on an item, it appears a menu, and you select item. And that's menu selection. Form fill-in. The name said that. What is form fill-in? This when you. Sorry? Yes, fill in a form. Input some information into a structured uh, piece of page, a structured page, like a form, like a web form. And it's again another interaction style that is not menu based, it's not direct manipulation. Common language. Common language is not a natural language. Like using the terminal, yes. So you give specific words to an application, and according to what you write in some language that is the common language, something happens or not. But you write something. So it's not selection, it's not manipulation, it's not inserting data, it's writing a language so that the computer can react to it. And then finally, natural language. Natural language. Yes, like voice assistant. So you interact by, well, not necessarily speaking because it's natural language, but you can also write, uh, but with your, uh, with an, an idiom, with a language, English, French, Spanish, Italian, whatever. Hmm? So it's not a common language, something that the computer n knows, but it's your language, your, the language you use to, to talk, to write, Etc. It's not necessarily vocal. It could be writing, hmm? and still. And each of them has some advantages and disadvantages. You can you can imagine, for instance, uh, which is one uh, disadvantage of the natural language. A disadvantage. 
Yeah, some advantage is that it's easy to access because everybody, in theory, knows that language. A disadvantage? It's hard to process. And? So you have a vocal assistant at home or use on a, on a smartphone, like Google Assistant or something like that? No? We have seen a video uh, um, of the grammar. What was the problem there with natural language? You can say whatever you want to a virtual assistant vocally or not. So no, if it depends, no. You cannot. So you are prone to use whatever you want to say as a natural language, but you, uh, but that thing will not understand everything you say because it's not another person, so it's limited. And so there is a disadvantage that could be uh, also, that is not written here, actually, uh, in a way, um, that could be make both parties aware of the things one can say and one can receive as an answer. So there is current natural language is not so different from common language in a way. You have to say, you have to know what to say to provide, to get the thing working, work properly or not. Um, in, in the case of virtual assistant, for instance, traditional virtual assistant. Okay, then here there are other principles that can, for instance, derive for the theory of Norman. Mm? So principle of good design from that theory. State and action alternative should be visible. Mm? Uh, should be a good conceptual model with a consistent system image. We, we, we talk about the loop, what happens, intention, etc. Mm? Uh, the interface should include a good mapping that reveals the relationship between stages, between the actions that are possible, between what happened next and before, and users should receive continuous feedback. So these are, again, general principles. But if you look at a page, you can say, OK, the state in which we are, the page we are, the state of the form we are filled, is visible or not? Is the form filled correctly or not? This is something about the visibility of the state of the page. Uh, is the, go the, mo the model that you have of the application appropriate for the application or not, and how we can make it more aligned with the user model. And if needed, there is feedback coming out from the application, correct or incorrect feedback. So these are, again, general, but easily to implement to say, OK, did I do all these things in designing the application or not? And in this case, since we build on a theory, we can have also um, when failure can occur. So users can form an inadequate goal, and so not able to complete everything, um, can use the incorrect item on the screen because a label, because an icon, because the label is missing with an icon, etc. Uh, may not know how to specify or execute an action. So the user interface should help them, should train them in a way, or may receive inappropriate or misleading feedback. So the person can know how to recover from error, doesn't know how to proceed, doesn't know if it needs to redo the things or not. Again, things to keep in mind while designing. And those are principles derived from the normal theory. These are instead eight principles uh, created by Ben Schneiderman, uh, that is an uh, emeritus professor at the University of Maryland. Um, in the United States that wrote a book that is one of the book that we mentioned at the beginning of the course and in that book uh, there are also these eight golden rules of interface design hmm? and again these are principle they are not specific to particular cases so one the first rule is strive for consistency that's again it mapped with the consistency theory the second one is scattered to universal usability that could be general, could be applied to mobile, virtual reality, etc. Uh, offer informative feedback. So feedback should be present and informative. Uh, design dialogue to hide the closure. Prevent errors. Permit easy reversal of actions. Keep user in control and reduce short-term memory load. Hmm? The memory load, the short memory we mentioned just before. So let's look at this. 
a little bit in deep. So strive for consistency, what it means? Uh, we talked already about consistency. It means that similar situations should lead to similar sequence of action within a similar, within the same environment, within the same application, within the same system. So we should have the same terminology everywhere. It's not that in page one we call a thing A and in page two we call the same thing B. Same naming, same position, same things, consistency across pages, across screens, across menus, across everything. In terms of layout, color, letter capitalization, used word, fonts, etc. And the exception should be comprehensive and limited like when you want to delete something, so some destructive action where you want to catch the attention on and bring uh, inconsistency there. Uh, so, for instance, this is an example, sorry if it's in Italian, um, this is an example in the real world, because this, again, these are general principles. Uh, I, I hope they, if they fix it, I don't know if they, um, so what is this, do you recognize this? What is this thing? Where, when you scan the ticket, so this is for um, getting information on the ticket, for a bus ticket, or to uh, enable um, a subscription, uh, a monthly ticket, for instance, etc. So this is very easy, but again, it's, it's not consistent. So here it's a attiva titolo, so enable title or enable ticket, and this is info. And in the label printed, uh, let's say that you should uh, enable your um, your ticket by pressing the ricarica key, so the recharge key. What is the recharge key? There is no recharge key because it's attiva titolo, the key. So this is a simple example of internal consistency and same uh, info for title, just info. So if you never have seen this, first time in Turing, first time using any of these, you say, okay, I need to press a ricarica and uh, um, to, to enable my ticket, and, but there is no ricarica. So this is, again, simple, small inconsistency that have people stop for one second and say, which should I press? And then after this one second, one say, okay, maybe it's that button, the, this one that I need to press because the other one is info, so that should be this one. But it's sort of guessing and sort of having people waste one second thinking when the, pe the people that do this actually could have talk and say, okay, I'm going to write a ricarica on the paper. Maybe you put a ricarica in the firmware. It's not so complicated. It's not a technical difficulty. It's actually people don't talk each other. At a certain point, they stop talking. And the people who printed is not the same people who, who did the firmware of this object. So this is, again, an example of internal consistency. Uh, and then there is consistency with mental models, and elevators are nice. Um, so this is a, so let me open all of them. Um, so how do you operate these elevators? So you enter here, you need to go, so we, how frequent is the possibility you make an error here? And then why, I, I, minus 12, I mean, it's minus 12 behind the ground and just 11 up, so it's, it's more profound, it's more deep than on the surface, I doubt it. And these are real, actually, real elevators, uh, it's not a fake it. And so here, huge possibility of error and totally inconsistent with the mental model on how an elevator work. You want to go to floor five and press five. And five should be after button number four and before button, button number six. And instead four, five is before minus five and six. Not minus six, six. And minus six actually the reason. So they skip one floor on the ground. Uh, or this one, why 
deposition. So you come in this elevator first time, you want to go uh, to the third floor. You press three, that's easy, but why three is on the left? I know there is not a door on the left and a door on the right, also because otherwise the five, where is the door on the top? Because it's the middle, so it's not positioning. So it's probably random. They come up with this and put buttons there, etc. Um, so this is consistency with mental models. Consistency, a lack of consistency. Um, create more errors, create more frustration using the system, create more people to say, I don't want to use the system, this application anymore, I will find a better competitor, a better application. Not an elevator, in that case you need to, to use it, but otherwise. Um, and then there is also consistency of interpretation. So which one is the selected one? Later or now? Are you sure? Okay, good, I, I'm neither. Uh, so consistency of interpretation. It, it can depend on how the entire application is, but these color coding are ambiguous because you cannot be sure. And again, like in the GTT um, example, you have to stop and think a little bit on what's going on. I'm, is now selected or is now ready to be selected? So it's now selected, so I'm seeing the ordering by now, or I'm seeing the ordering by later, and if I want to change, I need to press now. It's again, inconsistency of interpretation. So try to be consistent in the things, try to avoid this problem in user interface. Inconsistency of interpretation, of labeling, and with mental mode of a person. How things work, the idea of how we things work. And we say that inconsistency sometimes is good. So this is actually GitHub. These are the settings in GitHub. So the settings in GitHub are pretty consistent. So there is a title, then there is a small text, and then there is uh, rectangles with small text in it, and then there is another title, another text, and other rectangles with things inside, all in grayscale black. And then at a certain point, there is something that is with a red border, and button in red. This is inconsistent with the rest of the application and is made on purpose to highlight that this area you should get attention here because it's actually different from the other. So while you scroll mindlessly, you will at a certain point notice that this is different from the rest because this is red and the rest is not. The entire application has nothing red formatted in this way, except for the danger zone. So inconsistency are, is good to draw attention on things that, um, that can um, be maybe dangerous or can create consequences or where people or you, where you want people to pay more attention. Otherwise people will just scroll down. Because as you demonstrate with the assignment one text, people don't read. And it's also true on the, the website and on the application. So nobody will read all of these line by line. They will seek for the information in the page. And so if there is a difference in color, a different style and inconsistency, that will catch the attention. And there people will stop one second and see if the information they're looking is there. So inconsistency is good for drawing attention when needed. So strive for consistency. Cater to universal usability. Uh, people can have different needs and the interface should adapt and content needs to be transformed. So think about novices versus expert, young versus elderly, um, user with disability versus user without disability. Mm -hmm. uh, responsive design on a mobile application is, on a web application, is something that allow universal usability, not on the person perspective, but on device perspective. Or think about international and cultural vari uh, variation. So how do you, for instance, can imagine a variation that is international of a user interface? The change significantly 
what you should do in a user interface. International variation. Should work with different types of characters. Exactly. It should work with languages that are read from left to right and languages that are read from right to, to left. And what means also this? It means that if we in Western language are used, for instance, to find the button on the top um, right, where button should be in uh, a, a language that uses a different orient horizontal orientation? Should be there on the right or should go to the left? Should go to the left. So it's not enough just to translate things, but if there are cultural or international norms, then also the interface should adapt like moving stuff from one side of the other to adapt to international context and norms. Uh, offer informative feedback. So for every action, there should be a feedback. Not a big message every time, but just a feedback, even subtle one. Mm? So for frequent and minor action, a light feedback. Mm? Uh, for infrequent and major action, a stronger feedback. So, for instance, which is a minor, a light feedback? When you press a button, which is the, the feedback you have when you press a button on a user interface? Loading when it starts with loading. There is something, this is not light, it's actually big. Just in the button. What happens in the button? Yeah, the button change color or become pressed or there is a different shadow. This is light feedback, but still a feedback. Mm? Uh, infrequent major option is maybe a modal that say, are you sure? Or you're doing this. Do you want to continue? So something that say, or I completed the operation and the page is reloaded. So you see a new page. Mm? So strong feedback, but always offer some kind of feedback to the user to see if the action is completed or not. So this is an example of a terrible feedback, right? Because it's a problem in sending the message minus, minus one. So why is it terrible? It's not, informative. it's not informative. What you can do? Should you retry? Should you send an email to inform someone? Should, what should do? You can press close and then maybe you retry or, or not. What's the pro what it can do for solving the problem? I don't know. I'm just left alone. So this is not informative. And minus one is, of course, totally useless for a user perspective. Mm. Um, this is actually a good example of feedback. Mm. So when you install Visual Studio Code on your computer, if you don't install it, if you try to install it as an administrator on your Windows computer, uh, as administrator, so you download the, the normal Visual Studio Code, and try to install as administrator for all the users in the machine or to get higher permission, you actually get a very nice uh, message that say that the installer is not suitable for this operation and you should go to that website and download the, um, the system installer. So this is actually a good uh, feedback message because it tells you what's the problem your installer is not the right one for this operation what to do go to the website and download the system installer so you have a clear message for the error and how to proceed stop the process download another one and start again hmm? so this is actually a good example of uh, informative feedback of this operation uh, fourth principle design dialogues to hide the closure so every sequence of action in any application, every system should have a beginning, a development, and an end. Like in a storyboard, you should have a beginning, a development, and an end. Um, and you should provide clear feedback at, at the end. It could be light feedback, major feedback, to satisfy the user, but also to delete the current task that the person has in mind from their short-term memory, so that it's easy to prepare for the next one, without having a doubt, should they do anything else. Again, we mentioned in the first class is a book that was titled Don't Let Me Think. And this is the same approach. Don't have people think too much for basic and trivial uh, operation. 
lets them think when they need to solve some mathematical formula, some complex things, read some documentation, but for moving from page one to page two of a form, there should be time to think, a lot of time to think. Hmm? Um, so this is an example again, sorry for Italian, but you, you can select yes or no in this, in this message, uh, and then what happens? Who knows? There is no continue, submit, confirm. So I press yes and it's saved and proceed to the next page or I press yes and something happens. Again, who knows? So this doesn't give a sense of closure to the operation. So in this case, what's missing is some button that say next, submit, confirm, etc. So that the user is free to experiment, to press yes and maybe change his mind and press no if it wants, instead of pressing yes and then that's, that's it, forever, saved forever, it's yes forever, we'll not, never be able to change it because there is no back, edit, anything else that a person can do. Hmm? So this is about closure of beginning, development, end. The end is missing. Uh, prevent errors. There is value in communicating that something is in an error state, but when possible, it's a good idea to prevent people making errors, especially when the errors are uh, simple. Hmm? Like if I have a field that asks for a date, just prevent me to insert anything else that is not numbers. If I have a field that asks me for my age, again, prevent me to insert letters prevent me to do the errors. Instead of validating the errors, that is something you should do anyway, just prevent me to do the error in the first place. The user will be happy, will be less waste of time, will be less incomprehension, etc. Mm? So disable menu item, disable button links where they are not applicable and they cannot be pressed. Prevent entry illegal character in a specific field. Offer simple, constructive and specific instruction for recovery. So if I just made an error in a single field in a form, for instance, don't let me redo the entire form. Preserve everything and allow me to fix the single error that should be clearly identified. Uh, and an error should not alter the application state or should be very easy to restore it. Again, if I insert information on a page, it shouldn't be restart the process from the beginning. Hmm? Uh, here is an example again. Uh, it say enter to the logged in area and it say warning. If the username is a fiscal code, uh, insert it with capital letter. Mm? So that means that the username you can insert without capital letter. So how it's difficult from a programmer to take that field, check if it's capital and even if it's not capital just to apply a to capitalize method. How difficult it is for a programmer. It's not difficult at all. But instead, in this case, someone decides to say, okay, I don't want to do any validation, any conversion, etc. And so if I if it's not capital letter, probably will not work. Hmm? And I'm not even checking if it's capital letter. I will just insert lowercase. Well, in this case, it's more complicated, right? Because it say if the username is a fiscal code insert with a capital letter, it doesn't say what can be if it's not a fiscal code. So that's another kind of problem with this page. So you don't know what is a username. It's an email, it's a username, it's fiscal code for everybody. Who knows, actually? So maybe it's actually two login pages in this case, the solution, one possible solution. And let's not go on the, you are a professionist, re, re, regist, um, sign up. Because if you are not a professionist, you won't sign up. So um, anyway, so prevent errors. Uh, permit easy reversal of action. Action should be reversible because it relies on anxiety and encourage exploration. Uh, because if you know that you can do something and then before confirming, come back and change your mind, that will be a relief for anxiety, especially in some 
a particular context when you need to submit documents for some IDs or some taxes or something like that. And there could be different level of accessibility, a single action, a data entry task, or a complete group of actions. I, I want to revert the last three actions I did. Um, so Ctrl Z, for instance, on, on Windows to go back to the undo the action is one of these. Uh, keep user in control. The interface should always respond to user action and should minimize the tedious and lengthy task and should avoid surprises or changes in familiar behavior that is also linked to consistency and provide and do redo cancel confirm when possible. Again, to keep the person in control of what's going on. And here there's an example. Um, this is also an example. Well, here's an example. What's the problem here? Uh, so it's, it's a question, um, COVID time for teachers, where the option were, uh, which problem did you add in doing exams? And the first option was, I don't have problem. Uh, the second one is exam organization. The third one was uh, not, uh, hardware and software is not, good hardware and software is not available. Connection is uh, slow, and uh, you have environmental problems like too noisy. What's the problem here? You can uh, check uh, many options that have conflicts with each other. You can check many options that have conflicts with each other. Like I didn't have problem, and in the same time I had problem with the organization of the exam. So this small thing again, we are this example are just small things um, because the biggest things are typically fixed. Uh, but imagine you have answers like this for 1,000 people and you need to analyze them. These answer, you get these 1,000 answer and you throw them away because they are totally null for you, not significant at all. They cannot, you cannot learn anything about this because just this choice um, that the, someone who developed this form online decided to, to use in this way. And finally, reduce uh, short-term memory load. Uh, people can remember seven plus minus two. There was missing a two in the other, in the other slide. Uh, chunks of information, we already said it was a chunk here. So the mean, it average is seven, uh, but we can remember between five and nine. Um, chunk of information, quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so information on a screen should not be needed to remember it on the next screen. Every page, every screen should be self-contained. Uh, if possible, use the facility that technology allows. Like if you enter a phone number, try to provide autocomplete for the address book. If you need to have location, you can use GPS or localization on a website to get the current localization if the person want. Uh, long form could be fit in a single page for instance. So that's less information to keep in mind for the short-term memory lot. Um, this is an exception to the last one. I said fit long form in a single page, but look what Google do. Google for the sign up actually use two pages, one for the login from the username or the email and the other one for the password. So this seems a contradiction of what I said before. So I need to remember what, which email I use on the first page to the second one. So while not ideal, why do you Google do like this? Define security. It's a very practical reason actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's closer. It's for a similar reason, not, not identical, but it's a similar reason. Uh, so you can have, uh, so if you log in to Gmail with your Gmail address, you will go to the password that is all stored on Google system, on the same Google system. If you uh, log in with a university email account, uh, you will have um, 
either the single sign-on as with Microsoft, as he was saying, or this same screen. But this same screen, the same password, will not be checked against Google system, but will be checked against the university system. So the implementation of the second page is um, checked against a different server. So to keep this distinction, they keep the um, two screens separate for a very practical and technical reason. This is not real. Uh, this is similar here. You put the email, you press next, and they send you to another page. Yeah, but uh, the hacker uh, from the beginning does not know that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the organization uh, has something in the uh, And so it is linked. Because, you know. Could be. Yeah. yeah, could be. Because you see the address here, and so maybe the image, and so you, no, you can understand that the email is, is valid one for a Google account. That, that's another kind of, of, of thing, that there are things that happen in a popular way. Um, and here there's an, another like, exception. So here there is always Polytechnico or, yes, Polytechnico website. You have a list of certificate for English with all the score. Um, so while giving a selection is always is typically better. Uh, in this case, an autocomplete text entry where you start writing first and then 170 and autocomplete instead of scrolling this long list of item would be easier mm, uh, than just we were talking about reducing short term memory. Mm. So here it, it requires a little bit more memory because I need to type something, remember, okay, it was the first certificate. Uh, was other things instead of just recognizing it in a list but in this case there is a compromise between the too long list and the information I need to provide to continue with the operation mm -hmm. so entering with autocomplete that is a support is in this case better than selecting from a very very long list even if it required a little bit more of short-term memory um, then just to show you other principle very very quickly there are other principles that were adopted by Norman, Nielsen, and others. Um, and I just want to, to present it very quickly uh, because they, from one side, bring a new perspective, like learnability. There is not a principle in Snyderman that say they talk about learnability, but actually learnability of user interface is something important. You want a quick learning curve for learning a relatively simple user interface. But then there are other things that we have met. Visibility. Visibility of a system state, we talk about it. Consistency, we talk about it. Uh, familiarity, it's actually a Schneiderman prince, uh, rule, golden rule. Uh, affordance, we talk about affordance where we talk about the theory uh, in that second class. Um, uh, control, user control, feedback, we talk about feedback again. Uh, navigation, navigation is something that is not explicit there, but still is supporting people in moving around different sections of an application. So it's about effectiveness of an application. Hmm? So many of these principles, we will also see the heuristics, uh, many of these principles are actually overlapping. So consistency is something that happens very, very frequently. Visibility of the system, same. Familiarity, same. Uh, flexibility, universal usability, recovery, constraint, prevent errors, and error recovery. So there is some map between the various principles. That's why we just show you one, that are the golden rules, and then the heuristics to use in the heuristic evaluation. But because other design principles in the end quite overlap with this, with some, again, specification like conviviality here, that is something additional, or style that is not a focus on uh, Schneiderman uh, rules, but could be something still to keep in mind in designing and also in evaluating user interface. Um, again, 
make things visible, design for errors, when all else files standardize. If you don't know what to do something and there is a standard or a standard de facto to do it, use it. Because people are used to the standard, doesn't matter how good or bad it is, hmm? um, etc. Uh, other, if you want to have a look, other principle of interaction design, and you again can find many things, consistency, efficacy, fits law, um, simplicity, visibility, etc. things that happens. Hmm? So many principle, uh, quite a lot of them are very common ground because they stem from the same theories. Hmm? Okay, so these are principles. Uh, the idea is that you can, let's move to one of these, one, one of these lists, so let's use this as an example. You can, when you will design in next week or two weeks, uh, your first um, user interface, keep them in mind within the page and across pages. So do you have consistency within the page and across pages? Yes, no. Uh, do you provide feedback in the right way or not? Do you prevent errors? Do you keep the user in control so that the user can always stop an action, do anything on an action, come back, undo, redo an action, etc.? Is the memory load not um, too much used or not? So keep this principle, again, quite general, but here we have seen small examples hmm, uh, for applying them. Uh, and again, these are small examples because the biggest one typically are fixed. So it's the more difficult to find example of violation, a big violation of this. Uh, but I can assure that in your prototype will be big examples of this. So keep them in mind while you are designing next week and in two weeks your uh, first prototype of a user interface. With this, uh, we completed the design principle. Uh, next week, we will talk about prototyping and low fidelity prototype. And we will meet again other design principles when we talk about heuristics and the guidelines and the patterns uh, a little bit far in the course. But this, for a paper prototype, should give you some direction to proceed in the content. That's all. We will see each other tomorrow in lab eight that is just above the labinth the floor above the labinth we will do all the 4.5 hours there and uh, we will publish assignment two um, probably today or tomorrow so that you can have a look at the next step that are you know from yesterday tasks and storyboard and then paper prototype that we will met on monday have a nice rest of the day